Good morning or afternoon if you're on the East Coast, everyone. Welcome to Breakfast Club. We've been away for a bit, but we're coming back in style with um, a group of panelists today who represent core founders and members from Entomologists of Color. Hey, everybody, welcome. Hey. Um, yeah, you're, you can use your voices. Um, voices. Yeah. I, uh, so briefly, because I've asked everybody here to do their own kind of intros in a moment, what I want to do is introduce the five panelists we have on screen today. So we have Dr. Jessica Ware, curator at the American Museum of Natural History. We have Dr. Lauren Esposito, curator at the California Academy of Sciences. We have Salkatua Bondakawa Mafla, who is a PhD candidate at Rutgers University, Newark. Uh, Aaron Goodman, PhD candidate at the American Museum of Natural History, and also Megan Wilson, likewise a PhD student at AMNH. Um, and so before we dive in today, we are going to be talking about what Ento POC is, why it's necessary, how it formed, um, some of the science being done by folks on screen today. Um, but first of all, happy birthday, right? One year? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everybody was like, wait, whose birthday is it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what a professional host would have heed that up better. But yes, one year, that's amazing. And you've done so much and grown so much. Yeah, well, June okay. 10th, it will be officially 12 months. And it seems like just yesterday that we all were kind of convening to think about ways that we could process what was happening in our planet and in our culture. Yeah. Jessica, it wasn't a convening, it was a strike. It was a strike. It was a strike. We convened to strike. That's yeah. True. Um, well, thank you for pre, well, I'm kind of forcing you to pre-celebrate by announce, like, announcing it that way. But thank you for being here today. Really genuinely appreciate it. Um, and viewers, I will just remind you that um, you are welcome to leave questions and comments in either the comment section of Facebook Sorry, it's been a while. I'm kind of, I had a spiel for this a couple months ago, but uh, comment section of Facebook or the chat box of YouTube. And um, I'll weave those into the conversation as we go, but I think we're going to have a really good conversation today. Um, and I will go ahead and add, let's see here. I'm going to put the presentation on screen. I'm going to let Jessica kick it off and remove everybody else just for the moment. You'll mm -hmm. see them all again shortly. All right, and me too, I'm gonna get out of here. Jessica, thank you so much again for being with us. Thanks so much, uh, Laurel. Uh, so um, I'll just go to the next slide and say uh, my introduction. Uh, so I am an associate curator of invertebrate zoology at the American Museum of Natural History. Um, and I also have been really interested in giving back to my community, giving back to the scientific community at large. And so as such, I serve as the president of the World Dragonfly Association, uh, you know, a plucky group of volunteers who really like uh, dragonflies and damselflies. Um, and I'm also the vice president, incoming president of the Entomological Society of America. Um, and NSOC is the largest insect organization in the world uh, with over 7,000 members. And our, our goal and our mission really is to, you know, protect uh, food crops, provide medical and veterinary entomology support, um, as well as to understand uh, the evolution and biodiversity of, of the most diverse taxon on earth, which are, which are insects. Um, I got my bachelor of science from uh, University of British Columbia in Canada. I'm Canadian, um, and I did my PhD at Rutgers uh, in, in New Brunswick. Next slide, please. Um, so I'm a field biologist, and my research program really focuses on understanding how dragonflies and damselflies, uh, termites and cockroaches, are related to each other, and really kind of unraveling what we know about their evolutionary history um, using genetics, genomics, uh, and morphology. And um, I guess I'll hand it off to Salkatua. Thanks so much. Uh, so I'm Salkatua Vandakal Mafla. I'm a PhD candidate at Rutgers University, and I'm working with Dr. Ware at the American Museum of Natural History. I am studying dragonflies and damselflies. They're in the group known as Odonata. Uh, I'm really interested in what spurs uh, diversity in some areas of the world, what makes some areas uh, less species rich and some more species, uh, particularly across the Philippine Islands as I am a Filipina, a Tanois, uh, and an Equatoriana. So um, I'm really interested in why the islands are very species um, and what's happening across uh, the ocean in terms of some species that migrating, m migrate um, and some that kind of stay closer to home. 
Uh, I, as Dr. Ware also mentioned, uh, I am also very interested in serving um, our scientific society, the Entomological Society, and helping to diversify entomology um, and biology as a whole. I serve as the student representative to the governing board. I'm also the Systematics, Evolution, and Biodiversity Section uh, DEI rep. Um, and a lot of great things are happening in the Entomological Society. I'm really proud to be a part of that society that is uh, not just talking to the talk about diversifying, but doing what they can and learning along the way um, how we can kind of include more people in our work. These are just some fun field picks. And I think Aaron's next. Cool. Hi. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Aaron Goodman. Uh, I am uh, Dr. Jessica Ware's newest PhD student. So uh, I go to the City University of New York or CUNY, uh, the Graduate Center, and also the American Museum of Natural History. They sort of have this cool joint uh, consortium going on. And so uh, I study Odonata systematics, so how uh, different groups of dragonflies are related to one another. And then I also study their morphology, uh, particularly how they uh, how they lay their eggs in different substrates. So if you didn't already know, uh, dragonflies lay their eggs um, using this organ called an ovipositor. And depending if they lay their eggs in water or in mud, this ovipositor can have different sizes and shapes and different kinds of doodads and whatchamacallits and doohickeys. So I study how they're different among different groups of uh, odonata or dragonflies. Um, I'm also the uh, webmaster for uh, Entopoc, which we'll uh, talk about in just a little bit. And then I'm also the webmaster for the Dragonfly Society of the Americas. So I'm sort of the curator of, you know, different kinds of information that gets put on the website, just, um, you know, the positioning, posting of jobs. And then also on the Entopoc website, uh, I update the scientist of the month, which we, where we highlight a scientist of color and their different kinds of research just to really sort of bring light to that there are in fact uh, scientists of color out there doing really groundbreaking work. Um, so my education, I got a bachelor's of science from UC Davis. Uh, and then I just finished my master's degree from uh, San Francisco State University uh, working alongside uh, Lauren. Um, next slide, please, uh, Laura. Thanks, and so here's some of the, you know, um, good pictures of me out in the field. So I'm also a field e ecologist slash biologist. So I used to study how scorpions um, occupy the same ter territory with one another because they're cannibalistic. They need, scorpions try to segregate themselves within their environment to avoid eating each other. So that was sort of the main research point during my master's. Now I'm moving away from scorpions and more towards dragonflies. Um, but my favorite picture is one in the upper left-hand corner. I used to study scorpions that lived in trees. So using very, very highly sophisticated technology, i.e. a PVC pipe, I used to shake the branches of trees in order to jostle scorpions to bring them down onto my head in order to catch them. So, uh, you know, very fun stuff. Um, and then I think Megan is the next person. Hi. Hello, um, my name is Megan Wilson. I am currently a PhD student at Rutgers University Newark and the AMNH working with Jessica Ware. Um, I will defend my dissertation in less than two weeks. Um, and I guess where I started was I grew up in um, Sussex County, New Jersey along the Appalachian Trail and went to a community college um, in my county Trans with a degree in biology, transferred to Rutgers Newark University where I first started working with Jessica and fell in, fell in love with insects. Um, and currently I work on the evolution of termite, uh, termites, which are just fancy eusocial um, wood feeding cockroaches, um, particularly interested in their diet diversification, um, phylogenetics, and when, you know, when you're a field biologist and you're studying, um, a group in nature that's maybe not the most well-known um, or there's a lot of work to be done. Um, you find things you don't expect. And I ended up actually kind of switching uh, organismal kingdoms midway through my work and 
began studying also the ectoparasitic fungi that are found on termites. Um, in this picture uh, on the left is um, actually a mountain um, in the outback in Australia um, where kind of the really early diverging uh, termite species is found. And on the very right, you can see next to another nest mate. And I also um, really enjoy uh, natural illustration and drawing to better teach myself and to better uh, communicate science to others. And a lot of the drawings for Entopia C, I've been able to contribute. So it's been really exciting. I am Dr. Lauren Esposito, as you heard earlier, and I'm the curator of arachnology at the California Academy of Sciences, um, which means that I'm in charge of all things arachnid. Uh, and arachnids, although they are not actually insects and don't belong within entomology, um, are typically like really closely aligned with insects because they're found in similar ecosystems as insects. They're all most, mostly, almost all living on land, um, like many most insects um, and they are also arthropods. So they have a, like this hard exoskeleton. The, the main way that you differentiate arachnids from insects in a really simple way is that most insects have three segments to their bodies, whereas most arachnids only have two. Um, I think, you know, the reason that arachnids and, and insects are really closely aligned is, is because mostly like they're small little things that are relatively un understudied uh, that are found together in the same places. But but we, what really sets them apart is that arachnids and insects probably last shared a common ancestor like 500 million years ago or something like that. Like lobsters are more closely related to insects than they are to scorpions. Um, and, and, and so I, I accept the embrace of entomology because there are far, far more insects on earth and, and far, far more insect researchers on earth than there are arachnologists. Um, and, and I appreciate having having a home in entomology uh, as well as arachnology. But beside from my curatorial position at the Cal Academy, I'm also the founder of a organization called 500 Queer Sciences, which focuses on visibility for LGBTQ people working in all STEM careers uh, and I also co-founded and I'm the director of a nonprofit organization called Islands and Seas, which is really focused on um, providing access to researchers for really unexplored and exciting places on earth, but also providing the communities that are the stewards of those resources, of those spaces um, with access to scientific information and, and education. Uh, I'm, I love my job, and in part, the reason I love my job is because it takes me all over the world. I, I think, as, as Jessica mentioned uh, up in the beginning, and I think as, mo as you saw in pretty much everyone else's slides, fieldwork is a huge component of entomology and arachnology, and I think it's one of the things that really draws a lot of us in, is this opportunity to go out into nature and see things, explore things, and discover things for ourselves. Um, for the for and document many of them for the first time scientifically, and, and so that's a big part of my job. Is I go, uh, I I specialize on tropical island ecosystems, and so I travel to tropical islands around the world, um, looking for scorpions and spiders, and um, documenting the like estimated fifty percent of of life on Earth that that has yet to be scientifically documented, um, and and I do that using methods like genetics and um, uh, really high resolution imaging so that we can do this work faster than the rate that we're losing species. Uh, we're, species are going extinct on earth because of global change, but also because of human disturbance um, and human disturbance related global change. And so I think all of us feel this really huge weight and responsibility to try to understand what shares this earth with us before it disappears so that we can figure out what the appropriate interventions are for keeping it here. Um, and I think with that, we're gonna kick off like some questions. Is that right? That's right. Well, I think we're gonna launch into just a discussion here. Let me bring all the other panelists back on. And you're all amazing. I just also wanna say for all the PhD candidates, I'm just gonna go ahead and 
award you your PhDs right now because I feel like you've done enough. And it's very good <laughs> <laughs> um, and viewers, uh, we have uh, past breakfast clubs that dive way more deeply into Lauren and Jessica's work specifically, and then I'll work on the other three on here. Um, but I'll drop those in comments later. And yes, if it's okay with all of you, let's move into a discussion more specifically about Ento PUC. Um, and I'd love to just start by asking what were you, what What made it happen? What is the diversity of entomology right now and kind of what triggered the formation of this group? And Jessica, maybe you could kick us off. Sure. Um, so it's interesting. We do, It's not like we have necessarily um, a huge database that tells us everybody that's ever done entomology and everybody that's currently in school for entomology. But there are some data that are collected by groups like the National Science Foundation, for example, which keeps kind of, um, uh, uh, they have records uh, that tell you who was graduating with a particular type of degree. Um, and so they amalgamate, they kind of combine entomology and parasitology when they report those statistics. Um, and so keeping in mind, this isn't even just entomology, this is a combo of entomology and parasitology. When you look at the number of people who are getting graduate degrees, um, PhDs, it's 4.8% that are Hispanic, 2.3% uh, that are African American or Black, um, and less than 1% Pacific Islanders. Um, and so I could look at slide uh, 12 perhaps um, and just kind of show we recently uh, actually did a deep dive into this and we looked at at whether or not the amount of underrepresentation that we're seeing in entomology is just something that's really common across the sciences or if something in particular is happening with entomology. So in this, in this figure, what, I, what we're showing are circles that represent uh, white population, black or African-American population, and Hispanic or Latino population. Um, the way that the data is reported is in a kind of gender binary, which we can't really control the data that we have or the data that we have. So in this gender binary, the way that the data was reported, we have on the left side um, and the right side, different proportionalities depending on whether or not people identified as male or female. Um, but what we see is that for white people in entomology and parasitology, the numbers are proportional. They're kind of what you would expect based on the demographics of the human population. The amount of gray in the circle tells you the amount of underrepresentation there is. Um, and so you can see for Black or African American populations, the numbers are much lower than what we would predict based on human dem demographics um, and for Hispanic and Latino as well. Um, and this is in contrast to disciplines like psychology. Um, there are other disciplines where people um, representation is slightly le less underrepresented um, for, for minoritized groups. So when we look at these data, what it tells us is that um, something is happening um, and we would argue that there's systemic barriers to prevent participation, but something is happening that's making it so that uh, when we look across the discipline of entomology, we're not seeing um, you know, the diversity of the human population that we might otherwise expect. Um, do you want to, I know you had another slide for this. Do you want that now as well? Or is that not helpful at the moment? Sure. Yeah, okay. actually I'll, I'll just keep going and say, these are kind of, these can be layered, you know, the impacts of, of different ways that people are minoritized kind of intersect. Right. And so we often hear this, this, some would argue kind of poor analogy um, that there is a leaky pipeline of women in science where in this analogy, women are the water, I guess, that are flowing through this pipe and you have undergraduates kind of entering um, a scientific field and there are holes in the pipe that kind of allow the water to kind of leak out. So that by the time you get to the end of the pipe, which is presumably like a professional biologist or, or other STEM field, um, there's there's far less water in it than, than at the beginning of the pipe. There's a lot of problems with that analogy, of course, because in, it's not like people are passively um, leaving. It's not like the water is passively flowing out. People are actually being pushed out of the system. So, you know, you could criticize that analogy if, if you'd like. But what we find is that when we look at the numbers of women who are in entomology, um, and again, these are the numbers for entomology and parasitology combined, um, the numbers are very starkly different depending on the, the different kind of minoritized groups. Um, so the numbers for Black and Latin, Latinx, Native American, Pacific Islanders, they actually start very low and they stay very, very low. Whereas you can see um, for our white counterparts, um, for white women, the numbers actually do um, 
have a significantly higher um, number than what we see for minoritized groups. So it's not as simple as just saying we need to, uh, you know, address women in science and why there aren't more women in science, or we need to address um, why there aren't minoritized or racialized individuals in science, because these things can all be interacting together um, with multi multiple layers. Right, right. Does anyone else want to, I have more questions, of course, but does anyone else want to jump in on this one before we keep going? Okay, well, you know how to interrupt me, and I, and I take it well. <laughs> um, thank you, Jessica, for that. And um, I think maybe, let, so can we talk a bit about what those, understanding that there's lots of them, that they interact in all kinds of different ways, can we talk about what some of the barriers to participation in entomology are? Um, and Lauren, maybe you can start us on this one. Yeah, sure. Um, so, I mean, I think that, that Jessica touched a, uh, touch on a lot of the, the, the barriers that prevent participation, but, but I think, you know, really to, to emphasize that the barriers that prevent participation in entomology are shared across almost all professional um, workspaces. And those barriers really relate to exclusionary behavior that explicitly pushes people out of the pipeline and what we is, is often what people refer to in, in, in the STEM fields. But really, I think more and more that's shifting into a pathway. And so you can just imagine, and actually there's a, there's a slide with a very beautiful illustration uh, that, you can, that you can throw up that, that, that uh, illustrates this sort of pathway. And, and, and you can imagine that, and that I think is the next one. Maybe not, one this after one? that. This one? That one, one. that's the one. No, okay. one, more, one more, that's good, that's good. Wait, wait, this uh, one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay, so if we imagine, if we sort of like imagine that, that at the top of them, this hill in the, in the background, that's like the pinnacle, right? That's where you get a professional job as an entomologist. And so as you enter the pathway rather than the pipeline, you can get pushed off of the pathway at any given time. And, and there's barriers explicitly that push people off. Um, in many cases, those barriers are, are just an identity barrier. And those start really early, like early childhood. Um, and, and essentially what it means is as a child, you imagine what your career is going to be when you grow up. And the ways that you imagine what your career is going to be is based on your exposure to people that are in those careers that look like you or that share similar background to you, people that you identify with. And so if you never come across that representation, then the likelihood that you're ever even going to think or imagine that this is a career pathway or even actually a career period because you didn't know it existed it comes down significantly. And so one of the problems with, with oftentimes people refer to recruitment, like how do we recruit more, more, more black and African-American scientists and more black and African-American entomologists? How do we recruit them in the first place? Well, the problem is that they never even see the path. And so if you can't see the path, you're, you're, the, the possibility of recruiting people is impossible. And that's really an identity barrier. It's this lowest hanging threshold that tells people like, this is not a place for you, or you don't even know it exists as a place for you to mm -hmm. pursue. Um, it also like in general lowers people's self-confidence if they, if they do manage to find the path, it lowers their self-confidence and their ability to succeed and thrive in that path. So oftentimes they get pushed off of the path and back into the wilderness, if we can call it that. The next thing is that oftentimes people from historically excluded or marginalized or low socioeconomic backgrounds have barriers to participation that prohibit them from participating in the first place. So like if you get into college, can you like go on field trips with your class that may be over the weekend and are optional because you have to have a part time job in order to pay your rent or to help contribute to the family um, rent or to take care of your children or whatever the case may be. And so that ac lack of access, that differential access to resources mm -hmm. keeps you out of the path or pushes you out of the path. Again, like reinforces this lack of self-confidence that you already have, this sort of imposter syndrome that you should be there and that this is a space for you and a, and a path that you should pursue. Um, so that's sort of the next level. And again, this is like how people fall off of the path and don't stay um, and per, like, it is an upward hill climb. And uh, particularly for people that have these marginalized or historically excluded identities, and, and especially if those identities are intersectional. Um, so if you're a Latino person who also identifies as LGBT, that intersectional identity gives you an even greater sense of identity barrier and, a, and perhaps a greater resource barrier um, as well, like sort of layered on top of that, making the steepness of that hill even 
even greater. And and these barriers uh, continue as you move through this pathway. So like, let's say like you do manage to get through undergraduate and you discover entomology and you might get an opportunity of working in an entomology lab as an undergraduate volunteer and all you can get past all of that identity barrier and that resource barrier. Now you fit the recruitment barrier and the recruitment barrier says, is a graduate program explicitly recruiting you? And although things are really improving, for sure, because now people ha are beginning to wake up to the fact that that like BIPOC identifying people have been historically excluded from academic and professional cultures for a long time. Now, all of a sudden, the question is, has anybody tried to recruit you? Is there somebody like Dr. Jessica Ware out there who's looking for you as an individual and saying, hey, I want you to work in my lab because I recognize you're a really bright and motivated undergraduate young student. Mm -hmm. And I think for many, for many BIPOC identifying people like that doesn't happen. There's never this recruitment or they or the recruitment is not targeted enough and strong enough to convince them to overcome that identity barrier to say like oh no i really understand that this person really wants me and they're not like doing me a favor or like recruiting me just because of the of the color of my skin as sort of a tokenized individual and so getting past that recruitment barrier but there's also like some things like geographic restraints so like how do you get past the fact that like you might not be able to move away from San Diego and move to New York City because you have really close family ties or like requirements that that keep you in a geographic restricted area. So that's an, that's a recruitment barrier. And and this, this these things just continue and build up as you move up that mountain. Um, and eventually you are able to get past all these barriers and succeed or at some any point along the way you you just get pushed off of that path and 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 that's ultimately like why we end up with the data like like Jessica showed that shows that like as people move through this pathway that are, are BIPOC identifying people, they, the, the retention goes down um, rather than, than up, which is what we'd like to be seeing. Sorry, I'm long-winded. It's interesting because so much money has gone into recruitment really, mm -hmm. um, and not as much has gone into the ways um, in, it was just like getting people in the door, right? And there was, yeah. hasn't been as much money that's gone into the ways of targeting um, the specific groups of people or even like retention so that the environment's not toxic when you get a bunch of people there and then have them leave because it's a toxic workplace. Well, it's so silly, maybe, right? <laughs> yeah. So we probably could have been more strategic and hopefully people will be more strategic in the way that we spend our money, the university money, institutional money, NSF money, whatever the money is. That's yeah. true. I, I mean, I think it's also like comes down to like the the it's taken a long time for us to get to this place where people that are in positions of power within these professional societies like you, Jessica, and like all of the students that are here on this call who are also in relative positions of power are able to do something to remove that toxic culture. And, and, and I think that that's what it took. You know, I mean, people, they poured tons of money into it. Did it did it succeed to to recruit these people? I mean, maybe not, but also in some ways, maybe yes, because even like the one percent that made it through and became like really incredibly successful scientists that are able to be the first one that like the future generations see is is a success, even mm -hmm. if it's like a hard fought and like not as great of a success as we would have liked to see. I, I don't know. I mean, maybe, is that like a crazy idea? I think also an important thing to um, realize too is that, you know, what, if you are that 1% and then you get to the top of the hill, there are other kinds of extrinsic and intrinsic factors also that may impede your ability to be involved within the scientific community. So an example being um, the uh, publication of journals in English specifically, because most scientific journals are written in English. And let's say you're a very well accredited researcher international and English isn't your first language. And so if all the research papers that you're reading are in English, you're going to have a lot more difficult time keeping up with the fast pace of research that's being published within your field. So it's a constant struggle, even if you're at the top. It was actually something that we discussed a lot in um, Entopoc Journal Club, 
where we have both an English speaking Zoom uh, discussion in uh, English and Spanish. And one of the things that we discussed thoroughly was that um, the language of science is and entomology in particular is English. You know, whether or not that's, you know, hearkening back to colonialism where, you know, predominantly English speaking people did the majority of the science. Um, but, you know, we're constantly striving towards, you know, kind of closing that gap where regardless of what language you do speak, uh, you can be involved in the discourse of science. Yeah. So we've been talking a lot about how individuals are, are, are kept out. And I want to just to big picture this for a second, just ask like, why, why is it important to um, society as a whole to have diverse people studying entomology or insects? And we haven't heard from Salkatua yet, so maybe I'll ask you. Yeah, I think there's, sorry, I've got offspring in the background who are arguing about lunch. <laughs> That's, um, yeah, bring them on. <laughs> Settle have, this. Uh, I think uh, Aaron's, Aaron's uh, bridge right there was actually a good segue into, you know, why, why, why diversity in, in um, entomology and biology as a whole? Um, I think oftentimes this question is framed as like, what are you a minority, an underrepresented individual and a traditionally excluded individual bringing to this field? Like, why should we have you in? And I think a, a more, a more kind of appropriate and really like a, a more just way to approach this is to say, what is the field lacking or excluding if they say homogenous, right? If, if this field continues um, with a very narrow perspective on the study of insects, the study of life in certain regions around the world, um, what do we lose? And, um, you know, as an individual who, you know, if I was trying to do this work 10, 20, I use my mother as an example all the time. I think she was the greatest odontologist that never was because that place wasn't for her um, in the Philippines at the, at the time that she was growing up. Uh, they, the field is losing some really beautiful perspectives, right? If we're thinking of, we'll say the Philippines and my mother as, as my favorite example, um, but the first odontologist, the people that are first credited with publishing about Philippine insects are always European. All of our publications are by Europeans. So that means that a lot of our insects are actually named with European surnames. Um, not with local names, not in our local languages, not by our people, right? So observations that might have come generations upon generations ago are excluded in that knowledge creation. And the knowledge creation then doesn't come from a place that's local, indigenous, um, you know, native to an area, but instead foreign, uh, and in, in, in reality, a hierarchical type of knowledge creation, right? That some people are not worthy of that dialogue, the participation in creating the knowledge. Um, and biology as a whole, entomology or arachnology loses because that kind of information, that traditional knowledge is completely left out. So in terms of like, what we're doing, um, because most of our work is with entomologists and arachnologists in the United States, students that we're trying to lift here, um, I think uh, there's a really beautiful opportunity for a lot of diaspora students, students who have still those bridges to um, a lot of, most of us come from a lot of tropical areas where the greatest richness of diversity of insects and arachnids are in the tropics. Uh, so, you know, you have this great heritage, this lineage of people who were familiar with that kind of biology before it was even biology, right? Um, other people are, and you can all chime in, that's that's kind of my perspective. Uh, E.O. Wilson, I'll kind of leave it with this, but he was quoted with saying, I believe in 2019, it was right around then, but he was quoted with saying that, you know, like Lauren was saying, we have so much diversity that we're losing at a rapid pace right now. And because insects are the greatest uh, number of uh, animals in the, uh, on earth, we're losing them more than any other things, even before scientists can find them, document them, name them. Um, and so he was really calling for scientists to, to step up, to rise up to this challenge. We need more boots on the ground. And I think that 
we could kind of take that even further in terms of diversifying, in terms of decolonizing, and say that we not only need boots on the ground, we need those boots to kind of help encourage and reach out to the feet, the roots that are there, right? If we could kind of think of what people bring to the table rather than what, what would we be losing if we brought more voices to the table, we would really gain so much from bringing more voices. Yeah, I uh, think, go ahead, Lauren. I was just gonna say, like, I think that that, that you touch on so many really great points. And I, I don't know if there's any like statistics like this for entomology, but, but I know some, from some other fields, they've done <clears throat> some studies about looking at like the number of authors or contributors from the countries of origin. And, and for example, um, in coral reef studies in, from the Philippines, only about 40% of the publications involve, I mean, only about 40, about 40 percent of the publications that come from that have no collaborators as authors that are from the philippines or indonesia so i think it really like underscores the reality that like even still today people from the the regions where recruitment could be happening uh are are being excluded entirely and and similarly like in another example from from the botany world, there's a, a series called the Florida Flora of Ecuador that's like all the plants of Ecuador, and only five percent of the people that have contributed to that series are Ecuadorian. So this is like an actively occurring thing, not something that's like a historic legacy that we're talking about. It's like a today legacy. Um, but I, but I was really curious, and Jessica, I don't know if this is what you were going to touch on about. Like I know. Uh, some of the people on this on this live stream today have been have been thinking a lot about like the effects of having fewer perspectives ultimately like on on sort of policy making in particular one of the fields of entomology that's of 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 real rele relevance is forensic entomology which is like the use of of insects as forensic tools for policing and like ultimately arresting people and i i know that there's that there's some some kind of concerns about both because of as a result of who's participated in that kind of research in the past the way that that information is being used and whether it's being used um in a in a way that that's ethical Quite yeah that, it's a it's a really it's interesting how the makeup of who's doing the entomology can really shift the perspective and can really shape the questions that are being posed um and we we have actually talked with our colleagues who are forensic entomologists about um you know, the best practices for uh, in response to police, uh, you know, brutality uh, towards black people, towards brown people, um, you know, the best practices of the ways that we are going to give our time as entomologists to, to that field. Um, uh, but I what I was actually going to say was, was just that, you know, when you have more people participating, I think you end up having more productive scientific output, and they've shown that. But it's also little things like, I, you know, as a mom, as a as a uh, as a person who has children, I would say to my lab group, who here has kids? Does anybody need to take times or need to break? Are you lactating? If you're in the field, do you need time to do you need a place that you could do that? My advisors would never have thought to ask that, you know, because that wasn't their reality. You know, they were men who had wives who did 100 percent of everything. All they had to do was just live the life of the mind, you know, and write papers and supper was ready when they got home. So oh, having, nice. you know. Yeah, it must be nice. I, I can remember the first time I went to the field with my advisor and I was kind of assuming we would go get lunch somewhere, get a sandwich. And he had this lovingly prepared, uh, you know, three course lunch. And I said, oh, my God, like, I would love to have your wife as my wife because I would really <laughs> like this. This is fantastic. And he did share some of his lunch. But oh, I just nice. like it was very nice. But I think like having, you know, uh, having those other voices to kind of say, hey, this is my lived experience. This is what I need right now, um, actually just kind of opens up the, the discussion of what's what people need to talk about uh, to plan for the field, to plan for how long you're going to be out um, doing hikes, to plan if you, you know, um, need to have special accommodations that are going to be, yeah. um, you know, making space for people in terms of accessibility and what have you. I just think it's really it just opens up the topics of conversation. It's not that my advisor didn't want to think about lactation. It just never would have occurred to him totally. to, think, to think about setting something up like that up. That's that's really, I, that actually kind of, I think, answers a question that um, our view, one viewer, Kat C, asked, 
which is how does the perspective and personal experience um, that women and BIPOC scientists bring to the classroom and field affect positive change in the way in which scientific research is conducted? So I think covered a lot of that there, yeah. but yeah. I also, I also was gonna say um, one thing I was thinking about, especially when um, Lauren was talking about the coral reef research is, you know, science, like one of the things at least that I always found valuable about it, and I'm sure a lot of people have, is that it's supposed to be like one of the few like careers where everything is supposed to be as honest as possible, where you're literally trying to find the truth. And if you have this, you know, you're spreading, this message is spread that only the best research or all the research is only done by this group of people in these places, I think is extremely dishonest and damages the field itself, because of course that's not the truth. Like, of course, like people in the Philippines have been doing research on everything that's in the Philippines far before anybody that came in and did it. And their work is just as valuable, if not more valuable than any of that work combined. So um, that was just something I was thinking to add just for just yeah. the overall message of the scientific field. Yeah. We also yeah. just like or, lose um, information. I'm oh, sorry, Erin, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, I was going to say uh, also, Cassie, it really changes the narrative that when you imagine a scientist, they're white. You know, mm -hmm. it, it actually sh creates this amazing paradigm shift where when you think of a scientist, you don't think of it as this old white guy traversing the forest, you know? It actually adds, you know, color and diversity and intellectual diversity and cultural diversity to what you perceive a scientist as being. Also, just quickly, uh, Selfie and Megan, um, you guys actually brought up a really good point. Um, I think one of the really cool things that especially indigenous uh, cultures bring is their perspective of you know their knowledge of insects because they've lived in those particular regions their entire lives they probably know more about what you're trying to study than you do in most cases there's a really good book actually called uh, naming nature by ensu kim uh, she talks about how the indigenous tribes of papua new guinea independently created a taxonomy naming schema of all the birds of paradise which was i believe more accurate than what scientists from the Western world actually classified them as being. So in, that's one of the things that I really value um, in terms of this multiculturalism in science, because they probably offer knowledge that no one's ever talked about or written down or only described, you know, in passing or used in their day to day lives, um, which could be invaluable to, you know, scientists as a whole. Yeah, I've never been on a trip with any of the scientists from the academy where local people didn't come up and say like, are you looking for this? Like, do you want me to tell you about it? Or do you want me yeah. to show you where to find some more? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah but it a... seems like that's a real fledgling, like it seems like science is really only now starting to like really, the idea of, of, of valuing and including indigenous knowledge seems really kind of in its nascency as far as, as science is concerned, where it's just like, oh, wow, there is this kind of other wealth of data. And, you know, maybe, yeah. maybe yeah. it's worth, maybe it's valuable beyond just like telling me where to look for stuff myself, you know? Totally. Yeah. I, 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 oh, sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, Lauren, when you and I were in Guatemala, the little kids were saying, oh yeah, those scorpions that live in trees. Oh, I know where those are. <clears throat> um, so it's like, yeah. Anyway, please continue. Well, I was just gonna say, like, I do. I think that there's been a value for for indigenous held knowledge that's been recognized for a while. But the way that it's always been done historically was very extractionist. So it was like, okay, you tell me mm -hmm. the information, and I'm gonna take this information and write it down in my book and forget your name or where I met you or who you even are, and take it away and like publish it in some fancy research journal and then file a patent and make a bunch of money off of it, and you're never gonna see a penny. And, and I think that that's, that's really the shift that I'm really happy to see change mm -hmm. for the better, which is like, let's stop being extractionist in our practices and instead include indigenous or local knowledge that, that in a way that's not only providing recognition of the value of it, but also in a way that is providing recognition for the people from which it came. Mm -hmm. um, so for giving that attribution directly to them, and in many cases, giving the monetary value of that information directly to them. Well, let's talk. Um, let's talk specifically about NTOPOC for a bit now, which is really creating next gen scientists who are thinking about all these things much differently. But um, 
who is a good Aaron? Do you want to just do you want to start with just an over like not overview but introduction? What is entomologist of color? Yeah, sure. So um, definitely Jessica and Lauren hit the nail on the head. Uh, sort of what the preamble was for this organization. Uh, you know, three hundred some some days ago, uh, where uh, we were sort of, you know, we were all confined in quarantine, but sort of observing. Uh, externally the kinds of injustices that were going on in the world and then also seeing these different kinds of Twitter handles where um, you know strike for science and uh, the ivory and all these different kinds of predominantly um, black scientists Twitter feeds we sort of wanted to contribute something as well and we sort of thought what could we do now that would have an impact now despite you know us being confined to quarantine so we thought that one of the greatest ways was to allow BIPOC scientists the ability to attend research conferences um, free of charge. Because sort of touching on what Lauren said about the different kinds of barriers, you know, financial barrier is a big one. You know, not every, depending on your, you know, socioeconomic position, you may or may not be able to um, attend a research conference, which costs a lot of money, you know, traveling there, paying registration, um, you know, all maybe printing fees for your poster or something like that. And so that's sort of where these, uh, the like the primordial idea for uh, Entopoc came from. So officially Entopoc is entomologists of color. It is our organization where we strive to give BIPOC scientists uh, free memberships to entomological societies. And so we have a litany of different entomological societies that they can choose from. And um, yeah, and then also uh, we, our uh, organization, we sort of have a two prong approach. The first is uh, recruitment and retention. And the other one is advocacy where we sort of, you know, we try to bring in as many BIPOC students as we can um, through funding and, you know, allowing them to have the ability to be a part of these different kinds of research organizations. And then we advocate them. So where we, where we advocate, um, you know, different kinds of research articles like the one we published, or uh, we highlight students that have been very successful through Entopoc, and so we call them in stars, or we call all of the students who, uh, who are part of Entopoc in stars, and we talk about them and show them, you know, what their accomplishments have been, and it really adds and highlights, you know, um, you know, the litany of different students that are out there that could really benefit from a free membership. Um, that was a lot of word vomit, you know, feel free to fill in the cracks for me if anyone wants to chime in. I think you did a good job summarizing. I know that Megan maybe was going to talk about the enter POC fund in particular, but I, I do think that the recruitment, retention and advocacy angle kind of gets at the barriers that Lauren talked about in the beginning mm -hmm. to get people to be able to participate, to have the workplace be non-toxic and the discipline to be non-toxic for people to be able to want to stay. And then, you know, systemic change takes time because there are people who benefit from the status quo who might be reluctant to have change. And so it's it's never just a one-off. It's kind of like will be a, a long-term, um, you know, chipping away at systems of oppression to, to make space. Yeah. Yeah, just kind of reiterate um, what some of what Erin and Jessica said. Um, the two-pronged approach has the outreach and recruitment component, which is kind of our initial um, response with the coming out with the journal, saying kind of like what, um, you know, like why does diversity matter in entomology? Um, what's kind of like the status of, or at least preliminary kind of like, what's the status of outreach, recruitment, retention within this field? And um, we started a program uh, using an ENTO POC fund of money to provide professional memberships to students uh, that we refer to as instars to kind of reflect uh, the developmental stages within an arthropod's lifestyle as kind of like the steps um, and stages within a professional career, um, going along some of those steps along the path um, to kind of reaching the pinnacle within a professional career in entomology. And this instar program, um, we, have currently, um, as of today, I believe 368 students of color who've been um, funded to professional societies by this um, 
by this fund. And we took it a step further um, in November by funding, uh, we funded 40 of those students to attend and have a mentorship experience through the Entomological Society of America um, it's called a conference, um, which is uh, the largest insect conference. Um, and basically what we did was we had people um, from the entomological field, all different um, experts and members match up as mentors to these students. Um, and kind of, although it was virtual, we were able to have like a really, um, what I believe valuable experience um, with students with, with uh, similar research interests, were we able to help them with scheduling and going to talks and discuss papers. And um, I had participated as a mentor in that. And one of the things that I found really enjoyable and I think really beneficial was just being able to meet with the student and talk about their career goals even past the conference. Um, they had, um, I feel like it was especially helpful during a time of pandemic or for students who are isolated during pandemic, but also isolated if they feel like they don't have a community within entomology, they have somebody to reach out to and be like, hey, is this how you send an email to someone I wanna have as an advisor? Or I found this cool insect, do I just like send it here? Or do I ask them like, what do I, you know, like, you know, do I send a picture or do I do this? Um, if you don't have like lab mates in person to reach out to, that would be really difficult and um, intimidating, I think, to just find someone to ask. So kind of like building like initial networks, I think was um, something that was really, really valuable. So, yeah. And if there are students out there right now who are interested in entomology or already involved and they think this sounds great or people who have students who they think would be a good fit for this, how do they get involved? They could go to our website, uh, which I think you put into the chat, but the website has forms for different entomological societies. But um, jump in here if I'm missing anything, you all. But I, as, as I understand it, you know, say you have this, uh, uh, you know, uh, an insect society in the Yukon, you know, that you want to join that's not there. You could also just email us at entopoc at gmail.com and let us know um, specific ones that may not be already on the website. Yeah, and I think, I mean, it couldn't really be any simpler. Like if you if you think you might like entomology and you would like to explore whether or not you like entomology or you already know you love entomology and are thinking about perhaps becoming a professional entomologist, all you do is hop on the website. You fill out this really simple form telling us why why you want this, this scholarship essentially and we just pay your registration fee and sign you right up. And then all of a sudden you're, you belong to a professional network of entomologists um, that you can access like the journals and go to the meetings and go to like special events like talks at, and live streams. And so it's a great way just to like explore that interest and decide whether or not it could be a good place for you. And we think it is. There's also a journal club like what Erin mentioned earlier. Um, so if you're interested in, in, in kind of reading academic papers or reading scientific papers about insects but you're not quite sure how to do it um, or you are a veteran you know paper reader and you want to get the chance to, to do this in multiple languages um, we uh, we can let you know about that as well and if you're interested in hosting any entomologists out there who are interested in hosting a journal club about a particular article in a language that um, you speak also please let us know that that yeah, that still sounds amazing, and I and I want to I don't want to sign off without asking what's next for Ento POC or what's on the horizon for the group. Um, well, Dominic Evangelista, who's not here right now, but he's one of the members of this uh, collective. He actually recently just got a grant um, that will allow us to uh, actually collaborate with a sociologist and collect some demographic data that is specifically just for entomology about who's who's in our discipline, but then also about what the culture is like, what makes people want to stay, what makes people want to leave, and what could we do differently to kind of ensure that we have the most diverse entomology discipline that that we that we can. Um, so that's something exciting uh, on the horizon. I don't know if others have, have other comments, but that's what I'm, I'm particular, I love data. So I'm really looking <laughs> forward to, to that one, uh, especially since the data we have right now is entomology and parasitology to, together. So it'd be good to kind of have that disambiguated. Mm -hmm. I would actually like love, I would love to hear from, from the other three on here. Like, what are you most excited about for Ento POC in year two? Like just off the top of your head. Well, I. Oh, you muted yourself. Okay. Start again. 
Okay. Uh, I was just going to say shout out to Ento POC. We will be celebrating, as we mentioned at the beginning, if anyone joined us later, our first anniversary will be on the 10th of June, um, as we did with Shutdown STEM. Uh, so I'm looking forward to kind of connecting with the instars, uh, with the group again, and just, you know, lifting each other up and saying, we all made it. <laughs> We're here. Um, continued good work. We've got a lot of instars that are graduating. And so it's really kind of this beautiful family that we've been building. And um, it's really just great to see people succeed who who reached out and who were interested and eager. Uh, and, and we're just looking for a kind of family. Um, I will just also say that as Dr. Ware said, she loves data. I love data. So if anyone out there is interested and wants to join, but it's like kind of uh, insect phobic uh, and it's like I don't want to work with insects it's not always about working with insects sometimes it's just a really amazing amount of data that you can use in entomology and arachnology and that's actually what attracted me to the field uh, and for year two I'm, I'm excited to get more instars and to get now that we have a little bit of traction we've got a little name recognition and we've got support from some really big societies we're collaborating with um the arachnology society of america um you know entomological society of america a lot of different groups um it's going to be great to see what kind of real changes we can all make as a like as a big, big unified team a big family it's, i think it's there's a lot of hope out there that's fantastic um, I'll go next. Sure. Uh, sure. Kind of two things I'm looking forward in year two, uh, going to a conference where I see humans and and Hopak and stars. Uh, we did, we had, we were very successful with the online one, but it's going to be great where if we continue this mentorship, uh, not if, when, uh, when we continue it into year two, uh, it'll be great matching up mentors and mentees in person. That's going to be very exciting. Um, that's yeah. yeah. It's going to be great. Yeah. Megan? Yeah, so I would say uh, right now for, I guess, the, the thing that I'm most excited for is even just the the start of year two because, you know, our, our, our anniversary is coming up for the organization. And I just, I was thinking back, you know, a year ago and us all, there was, you know, it was a really rough time for the world and it still is rough, but it's, you know, it's, I think it's just nice to see that after a year that some things have despite how difficult it was, have gotten better. And I just remember sitting on a call with the founding members and we were almost in tears. Like it was just, it was it was a really sad and kind of depressing situation, but we're like, you know what, we have to do something. Like the only way to get through this is to, to try and promote some sort of good change. And I feel like it just was kind of proof that, that, that you can, that it can be done, that, you know, no matter how small, like every change has to start somewhere. And, um, just seeing all the good that's come out of it is, you know, being able to kind of see some of the rewards of that change in the second year. Yeah, I mean, hundreds of hundreds of students helped is a lot of good among all the other yeah. work. That's amazing, yeah. Plus a lot of people I think have been able to decorate their home with the swag uh, that Megan has made. So we have a we have a fundraising initiative to try and raise money for these, these funds. Um, so it's great for Anto POC, but actually, Megan's a, an amazing illustrator. So her artwork um, for mugs and pillows and sweatshirts and hats and stuff, I actually always am so excited when a new batch of designs come out. So I'm excited for 2021 designs, uh, for year <laughs> two designs. I take, I take any suggestions, anything. Um, I've tried to at least like any suggestion, try to draw it up as quick as possible and get it out there. Cause the whole point of doing the, the merch, I think was just people asked and I thought, you know, like a good way for outreach was to try and um, have these Zazzle designs. So it could be on a shirt, it could be on a hat. People could go yeah. into the fields and they could um, feel like they were representing their themselves and representing other entomologists. Um, and, you know, for that reason, like when I created the Zazzle shop, I don't know anything really about business. I'm, you know, a termite scientist and kind of like informally uh, all the illustration I've done has been like self-taught and everything. And um, just promoting the page, I was like, okay, um, they give you an option for like what to put on royalties for the for the products. And I always kept it super low. Cause I'm like, what I'm trying, like I'm trying to like, I want as many people as possible to be able to afford the products that they want to wear. I don't like, if we make some money, that's great. We'll put it right back into the fund. But like the big thing would be to, 
as, as many people that want to represent, they can. And for, I think right now we've sold like over 150 items, which is really like, that was the most exciting part for me, was just knowing that, like, that that many yeah. people have seen it and um, can share with their friends and hopefully get more people involved. Well, we just dropped a link to the and to a POC Zazzle store uh, everywhere. So, um, is an insect you like? I can draw it up for, for try my best. <laughs> take, take, take commissions. A modest fee. Yeah. Um, no fee. Oh, but I right, think right. that's a good segue also into just like the question of how people can help, how they can help to diversify entomology, how they can help ento POC um, specifically. After first step, make sure you're wearing an ento POC hoodie. Second step. I'm just kidding. But yeah, I think that would be a great a great way because we have lots of people who I know are really grateful for this conversation and um, do genuinely want to help, but may not be directly involved in science or may just, you know, be enthusiasts. So what do you think? Well, I, I mean, I think for one, if you if you just love what we're doing and you want to help support students in entomology, um, both attending meetings, but also professional uh, society scholarships, you can just donate we, through our website. We have a donate page if, if contributing funds is the way that you'd like to help. But I think even more, you, allyship comes in every fo shape and form. And and when I think, I think an important thing to think about always is that ally is a, is a, a verb, it's an action word. You have to do something actively in order to be an ally. Otherwise you're just sitting around like observing things happen, uh, particularly to excluded groups of people and and so it, anybody can be an, an ally to entomologists or to future entomologists in particular. So if you're out there and you have kids and your kids are interested in the things that are crawling around in their backyard, like let them know that entomology is a career and it's a pathway that includes a diverse set of people um, where they would be welcomed and, and well received. Um, but more importantly, that the world needs their perspective, uh, mm -hmm. that that having this diverse set of perspectives that come from all different kinds of backgrounds is the way that we progress entomology and it's the way that we better understand the and interpret the world around us. So like give 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 those kids around you an extra level of encouragement and let them know that like studying insects is a thing that you can do and you can have a real job that makes actual li living studying insects. Uh, and, and I think, um, for those of you that are out there that don't have kids that want to do something, if you're a professional entomologist or working in any field, you you can also be an ally to, to young entomologists, just talking like to your friends and family at a cocktail party. You want some entomology facts? Uh, we can give you some entomology facts to talk about at your next at your next dinner party. Um, just letting people know that like entomology is a relevant field and it's relevant because it's used to solve crimes, it's used to pollinate the crops that you eat, uh, it's used to clean up the waste and break down like all of the, the excess nitrogenous waste in the world. Uh, and so the basically the world wouldn't function without insects and, and the way to keep the world functioning in the future is to understand where the insects are and what they're doing. That's my mm -hmm. spiel. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think those are all good, good points. <laughs> Uh, Laura and I would say Thanks, everyone Jessica. should go and do all of those. I think um, if you if you feel like you have time and time is what you could give, there always are lots of things behind the scenes. If you like, I said, if you speak another language and you'd like to be able to, you know, do host one of the journal clubs. If you are planning to attend one of the entomological meetings, it could be entomological society, but it could be any entomological society, um, and you'd like to set up, you know, work with us, set up a mentoring uh, program for the students or the instars that, that are members of, the, of that society, just reach out, you know, entopoc at gmail.com, um, and we're, we'd be happy to work with you. Yeah, and we have had a lot of people um, reach out, a lot of people, a lot of groups, a lot of universities, and that's been really, really encouraging and really valuable. Um, we've had people contribute their time, their artwork, the journal club, um funds for sure and um just whatever you can great i'll yeah. make one last push for mentors uh we had mentioned that we have an kind of an official mentoring program happening at the entomological society of america um and if anyone is interested entomologist or not in just supporting uh the next gen i, I think a lot of us have said that we're here because someone mentored us Say things for the background noise, <laughs> but um, I I know I'm only here because 
some good people, Dr. Ware, Dr. Esposito included, um, cared enough to share what they learned along the way. And, you know, no one told them they had to do that, um, but they did and they believed in me. And sometimes that's all any of us need. Yeah. Um, one final note I'll do is that if you want to be put on the website as our scientist of the month, feel free mm -hmm. to email us as well. Um, usually it just involves me going through different people's Twitters. Uh, so <laughs> stalking essentially. So, uh, if you want to be, if you want, you know, your research or your lab's research highlighted on the website, let me know. I'd be happy to do it. We are looking for, uh, this June's scientists of the month. Um, so, uh, yeah, come strike while the iron's hot. So if there's an entomologist of color out there that you admire, you can also send them our way. Yes, oh, yeah. exactly. Fantastic. All right, we put the link for the NTOP website, Zazzle Store, and Twitter are all in the comment section wherever you're watching. Um, and I want to thank you all so much. But just before I go to, I want to ask if there's any anything that any any last thoughts or anything anyone wanted to say or share that didn't get mentioned yet. I think thank you, thank you for giving us the space to talk about this. No, thank you all for coming on. Um, and I, we should do it annually. Yes, Jessica. <laughs> uh, well, I would thank you to you, Laura, for having a thank you to the CAS and Do Breakfast Club, but also thank you to all of the people who donated over the last year, time, money, um, and et cetera. Uh, the support that we've received from the entomological community um, and from our peers uh, has been amazing. So thank you to everybody who's watching. Yeah, absolutely. Nothing, nothing like seeing a renegade group rise to the top, Jessica. <laughs> <laughs> We're taking over. All right. Well, we hope to welcome all of you back to Breakfast Club for future episodes or your instars or whomever wants to come on and talk about entomology or diverse science. And um, can't honestly thank you enough for being here. And thanks to everybody who watched. Um, and yeah, we'll see you all again soon. Thank you. Thank Take you. Care, everyone. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye.